Islands, and you credit the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Seneca. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Inuit, and Metis people. I want to welcome you this evening to this presentation and discussion on anti Black racism in Canada, hosted by Beth David and featuring Bernie Farber and Nigel Bariff. <clears throat> Recognizing that we as individuals and as a community need to broaden our understanding of racism before we can take meaningful action, today's event is an important step to better understanding the racism that exists both within the Jewish community and in the broader community of which we are part. This evening is the first in what we hope will be a series of programs addressing racism, and we are so pleased that you have begun this journey with us as we work toward creating meaningful anti-racism action that we can all take. Our next program will take place on Wednesday, August 26th at 7.30 p.m. and will feature a panel of Beth David members comprised of Fleur Sampson, Neely Moses, and me, Essie Mutikang, where we will explore our prayer for Canada, anti-racism, and Judaism with Rabbi Shine. As this is an evolving program, it aims to be responsive to the needs and interests of our community, so we encourage you to please reach out to the shul if you have ideas for future programming. I now have the privilege of introducing Bernie Farber. Acknowledged as one of Canada's most accomplished NGO CEOs, Bernie's career spans more than a quarter century, focused on human rights, pluralism, and inter-ethnic, interfaith, and inter-race relations. Recognized and called upon by the courts, media, and law enforcement as an expert in human and civil rights, he is one of the few in the field to be accepted by Canadian courts as an expert in hate crime, white supremacy, anti-Semitism, and anti-racism. His efforts have been documented in numerous Canadian human rights publications, books, newspapers, film documentaries, and magazines. His work has also been cited for his expertise in a number of academic publications. Mr. Farber has successfully run large NGOs and foundations such as Canadian Jewish Congress, the Paloma Foundation, and the Mosaic Institute, all focused on social justice and human rights. He has also worked closely with Canadian Indigenous communities on historical redress. Today, Mr. Farber is, as he likes to say, rewired as opposed to retired. He is a skilled consultant on matters of social justice and an acclaimed and sought after speaker. He writes for various newspapers in Canada and the US. He's chair of the Canadian Anti-Hate Network and sits as a board member of Human Rights Watch. He chairs the Rights and Ethics Committee for Community Living Toronto and is a former co-chair of the Ontario Anti-Racism Directorate. And his latest venture is the publisher of the new Canadian Jewish Opinion and news site, The Canadian Jewish Record. Now, without further ado, I will turn it over to Bernie Farber. Estian, thank you very much. You uh, read that exactly the way my wife wrote it, so I really appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> the real problem with Zoom, uh, my dear friends, is that I can't hear your laughter when I crack my joke. So that's going to make things a little bit difficult. Uh, but we're going to carry on because this is... Uh, a very important uh, subject that we're broaching today. I am ever grateful to Beth David for moving this issue forward. Um, it, it's an issue that I've struggled with much of my professional career. Um, as a Jew, uh, I understand and I think we all understand what we feel in our heart and in our soul. Uh, many of us have connections uh, to the Shoah. Uh, many of us uh, have parents, grandparents, and some here may themselves be survivors, real heroes. So we, we kind of get the issue of pain. We kind of understand what it means to be discriminated against. Uh, we, we, we have struggled, I think, quite valiantly here in Canada um, and, and around the world to work with uh, those who also feel that same kind of pain especially our friends in the black community, people of color uh, in, in this country. Um, there has, in, in, in my time with Canadian Jewish Congress, which started way back in 1984, I was always reminded of the fact that um, for a good 25 or 30 years, even prior to, to my coming on to Congress, that there was always a close relationship between the black community and the Jewish community here in this country. Uh, a lot of it spans back to the work that we did post-World War II. Uh, many of you may not know this, but in fact, uh, black labor leaders, the Canadian Jewish Congress, the Canadian Labor Congress, 
were absolutely essential in developing, for example, the Ontario Human Rights Code. And the Ontario Human Rights Commission actually evolved out of the work done between the Black community and the Jewish community. So we have history, but we also have pain uh, on, on both sides. Um, there were issues in the past that drove us apart. Then there were issues that brought us together. What we're going to try and examine today are two very important aspects of this. We're going to try and examine and understand the history of Black Jewish relations through the lens of understanding uh, anti-Black racism. And I, I can't tell you how uh, thrilled is not the word that I, I, I want to use in this format, but <laughs> that's kind of what I feel. Um, my dear friend, Nigel Barrow, who is the president of the Urban Alliance on Race Relations and a school teacher here, and he and I, and he sits actually on, on my board at, at, the anti, at the Canadian Anti-Hate Network. And by the way, I urge you all to have a look, if you have a chance, somewhere sometime down the week, take a look at our website, antihate.ca. Uh, we are one of the few, maybe one of the only organizations that actually confronts racism, anti-Semitism, extremism, white supremacy, um, all of those ingredients that, that, that cause this vile hatred in this country. And we can always use your help and your assistance, so please do ha have a look. Nigel sits uh, on, on this board with me. We've done work together uh, through the Urban Alliance. And this is actually the first time that he and I are involved in a workshop dealing with anti-Black racism and the Jewish community. And I, I can't personally think of a better person that I want beside me when we discuss this issue. So the way the evening is going to uh, evolve is I'm going to very shortly call on Nigel to do a, a brief presentation um, on, on the issue itself. And then he and I are going to have sort of this fireside chat together. Uh, I'm going to ask him some questions, he's going to respond. Um, and we're going to leave, I hope, lots of time for your own questions, which you'll write in the chat area. They'll be passed on to me and we'll try and answer as many of them together as we are able. So without any further ado, let me call upon my, my, my friend, my buddy, my comrade, um, a person that I feel very close to as we work together to uh, understand this issue of, uh, of racism in this country, my dear friend, Nigel Barrett. Well, thank you, Bernie. Um, you know, it always makes me laugh when Bernie Colt says that he's retired, because I'm telling you this, he is like the hardest working retiree I have ever met. And, um, and I know a lot of retirees, so um, I am so grateful and so humbled to, to be here with all of you today. Um, you know, Beth David and, uh, and Rabbi Walker, um, Corinne Essien for welcoming me and, and all of you being on the call today, like think about it, it's, it's, uh, it's Wednesday night, it's actually a really nice night out. My, my four year old has been taking us around to all the playgrounds, so I know that, uh, that normally all of us would be outside, but here we are, you know, taking on something that is you know, a deep conversation, obviously. So thank you um, for being here. Thank you for, for, for coming, for us coming together. Um, just like really quickly about me. I, I was born in Kingston, Jamaica. I came here to Canada just as a baby. I was a year old, so I didn't have a choice. My parents came here for the better life and um, which it's been. And, um, and so, you know, um, growing up, you know, in, in, in the black community, in, I grew up in the, in the church. I didn't, this, I didn't have, um, a deeper, the deep understanding of, of the pain that, that, that Bernie talked about that the Jewish community came into until the, the birth of my son and at his bris. And, uh, my, my, you know, my partner who's, um, from the Jewish community, we, you know, it was, you know, through those stories, she jokes a lot because she says like, you know, well, all of our celebrations are, you know, it's either about people that they, they died and then they survive and then we eat. And that, you know, whether it's the high holidays or um, whichever one of our celebrations, it always has something to do with that. And, but, you know, you realize that there's been thousands of years that, that both the black community and the Jewish community have gone through and struggle. And so this is why moments like this in this moment of, of, um, 
of racial reckoning is so, so important. So as Bernie said, I'm gonna go through like a really quick kind of framework just to give us a better understanding of what anti-Black racism is, because we really wanna get to the opportunity to have a back and forth at least between Bernie and I, and then we'll try to do our best to take questions. This is not the ideal. This is just a start. This is just like kind of a taste. So yeah, that's what that's, I hope that that's okay. Um, I'm going to screen share with you all. I hope it worked the first time. Let's see if it works the net this time. Um, okay, PDF, why, where are you? There you are, okay and share. Okay, so um, thanks SCN for, for making sure that we did that. The, the land acknowledgement, which is so, so important. Um, Urban Alliance of Relations, Race Relations, we've been doing this for 45 years. We came together 45 years ago. Obviously I wasn't there. Well, you can't really tell, but I wasn't there. But um, our, our, our folks, um, you know, it was at a time when a lot of black and brown people were coming to the city in the mid 70s. The, um, you know, folks would be, black folks or and brown folks would be getting on the TTC and were going through all sorts of types of micro and, and, and very aggressive race, racism, racist um, attacks against them. And so at the time it was actually a, a number of rabbis, uh, a number of, of, of folks from the, from different, uh, from different faiths, um, labor organizations and, and NGOs that came together to say, how do we build a Toronto that brings people together? And so they've been doing, Urban Alliance has been doing work around education, around police civilian oversight, um, and, uh, and around advocacy on many different issues. Um, so today, here's a, an agreement. And again, normally this would be co-created in, in a in a together in a, in a workshop. And I know that I, I can tell there's already a bunch of you very talented workshop facilitators. So I'm just going to throw this at you during our during this this hour we have together, or you know, 45 minutes we have left together. There is no judgment. This is everything is safe and confidential. We're going to use I statements. We want you to ask lots of questions. This is a positive and accountable space. Um, how, um, however you are feeling is okay. This one's an interesting one because people don't get it. Discomfort is okay. And that, you know, this is aims to challenge you and, and those around you. So I'm just gonna leave that there, obviously because of the way that this setup is, I'm not gonna be able to get your feedback right at this moment, but I just hope that that's okay, that you know, if you can all give me a, a head shake, maybe, that, maybe that'll work. Okay, all right, that was really good. You did that all in synchronicity, thank you. Um, so just quick, quick uh, um, definition of racism. The official definition says that, you know, it's a system of advantage based on race, where one race is believed to be superior to others, creating inequality and um, inequity. And, you know, the way that I'm always, I'm still challenged by this definition because it makes it sound as if it's still, you know, it's still that it's gone, you know, that, that racism doesn't exist anymore. Um, but specific, specifically for today, I wanted to talk to you about anti-Black racism, because we know there's many different types of racism. But today, anti-Black racism, which is defined as prejudice and attitudes, beliefs, stereotyping, or discrimination that is directed at Black people or African people of, descent, of African descent, and is rooted in their unique history and experience of enslavement and colonialization. And so, you know, again, as I said, you know, it makes it seem as if it's over, but we know that this is prevalent and it's systemic, and we'll we'll unpack it a little bit of that. But I, I wanted to draw your attention to 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 this uh, this um, newspaper where it says "Our Freedom Can't Wait." And when you think about, you know, you see these these titles, and just this weekend, my family and I were down at a Black Lives Matter or um, uh, for directed at education rally. And it was the same cries that you heard from folks in, in um, you know, when we, when we were marching. And, uh, you know, the history of anti-Black racism goes back 200, we've had 260 years of slavery that was practiced here in, in, um, in, in, in Canada. Um, it wasn't until 1983 that the closing of the last segregated school happened. So, I mean, for, for, for many, for some folks, you know, it was within your lifetime that, that, that the last segregated school here in Canada closed. 
um, 16 percent is of all hate crimes um, are against black people and it's you know one of the most common and that you know almost 50 percent of Canadians believe that it's okay and actually normal to have uh, racist thoughts uh, anti-black racism there's, there's it's layered right and and today again as we're going through this kind of really quick overview there's systemic racism interpersonal racism and internalized racism and i'll and i'll kind of talk to a, a few of them but you know systemic in, uh, systemic uh and institutional racism embodies policies and practices that create different outcomes for different racialized groups specifically creating advantages for whites and oppression and disadvantages for other people from other groups um, classified as people of color and it encompasses an entire system of white domination diffused and infused by all aspects of society including its history cultural politics economics and entire social social fabric so when we talk about systemic you know like right i'm, a, I'm an educator right so so we we look at the high school dropout rate and and that and what we find is that disproportionately we have um black and indigenous children that are not graduating at the same rates as their their whites and and other counterparts and uh and that's you know that you know thankfully the toronto district school board keeps those race-based statistics um you know other examples of it is is having um the, the making up only eight percent of the of the uh, population but yet being 40 percent of of of, of deaths by at the hands of at the hands of police when during mental health crises and there's a number of other ways that how systemic racism um, operates then the, the not the other layer is interpersonal and an individual's assumption um, of beliefs and behaviors that, that can be conscious or unconscious that are exhibited and in, in interaction with others so you know um, you know, on a, on a, on a personal level, I, I, it, it's, it's, oh, I love your hair. It's so soft. And, um, and we'll, we, you know, we'll, we'll talk about other examples of, of that. And then there's internalized racism where, where folks themselves, black folks themselves start actually believing a lot of the racism that they hear targeted at, at them. Um, and then you have daily mi microaggressions. And, I, and I'll, I just got a couple of cartoons that I wanted to kind of share with you. It's not easy to read for some, so I'll, I'll read it to you. So it, it has, uh, the young girl says, uh, what's up guys? Uh, Susan wants to know why we're, we're oppressed. You're forced to wear that hijab that you can't get an education. Your husband controls you. Uh, it's, and then the response from her is, it's my choice actually. I, I went to law school. Susan, uh, and then it goes on. Huda, can I play one more more game of over of Overwatch? Just remember to vacuum, please. This is her husband speaking to her. Sweet. Okay, that was expected. And so, it's just you know a really quick way of just just demonstrating um, how sometimes these relationships that when we when we're speaking with with black people and and you don't you know I many times folks don't mean to like hurt somebody's feelings. You're not meaning it in a, in an awful way, but you know, that's, it's how black people receive it thinking, why are you just making this assumption? Right. Um, and then, you know, this other cartoon is just showing uh, how this, you know, how the white, this white uh, teacher see treats two different women so on um, the first woman who presents as white he says so what colleges are have you applied to and and with the the the, the black female student he says will you be the first person to to graduate in high school and i got to tell you like that happens a lot in regards to those types of assumptions um and then in the next cartoon you see she says well what's your major and then um, is what the little girl says to the white presenting woman. And in the other caption, she says, um, are you the first person in your family to, to go to college? And again, you know, it's these assumptions that are, that are being made based on one's, one's color or, 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 his, or background. And, uh, and you know, the, the next one, sorry, is uh, 
she she says he says to her over coffee do you do you have any kids and you know the the to the black woman he says uh, how many kids do you have and you know again another example of the microaggression is you know uh he says to the white woman with her child what does your what does your husband do and uh the doctor says to the black person black woman you know is is the father still in the picture so as you can see you know you can start from the systemic level of of racism the interpersonal um level that of racism and anti-black racism has it you know i i didn't talk to you yet about what happens on the internalized racism that within, you know, uh, um, their own black folk. I mean, I, I can give you a personal example of the internal racial, racialized piece, piece. My mom, rest in peace, um, would always, would never let us go to the store by ourselves because she was always afraid when we were just children or, you know, in, even in our young teens that we would be, um, you know, followed by the, followed by, uh, security or somehow something something would happen and then you you feel like all of a sudden I, I mean the, even now you sometimes I think yeah I should be cautious before going in that store do I really need anything because if I do what's going to happen it's something it's a feeling that becomes internalized and then you know and then <laughs> you know for a lot of times when when um you're just the woman we are talking about the examples of, of from from um, these women and the way that that the women in the black the black women would would be receiving these uh, um, on the other side of things what happens is that black people are accused of of or gaslighting and you know gaslighting is intentionally or intentionally making someone feel that they doubt their memories or their perceptions or reality of, of lived lived racism so you know, the doctor that asks, you know, how many, how many children do you, or is the dad still in the picture? And when you call the person on it and say, well, you know, why are you making that assumption? You know, the, the natural reaction sometimes is, oh, well, you're being too sensitive. That's an example of, or you're taking it personally, or that's not what I meant, or can you take a joke? The, that's an example of, being gaslighted and it's something we you know again which it's just it's it's the lived experience of black people that you know here in toronto and across the globe that this happens on a daily basis i i want to talk about privilege and and privilege is not necessarily negative you know privilege is you know the definition of privilege is advantages in power um, that we benefit from and that incur from the loss of power in others. And, you know, I want to make sure I acknowledge, like, I have privileges as a male. Um, I, I can walk around late at night without necessarily worrying or um, about being attacked, for instance, as an example, or maybe by the police. Uh, you know, at, as a university graduate, I, I, I certainly have privileges in regards to job and, and, and income. Um, but there's also, you know, being aware of, you know, pri privilege or becoming aware of privilege should also should not necessarily be viewed as a burden or a source of guilt, but rather an opportunity to learn and be responsible. So that way we can work towards being a more inclusive and just, just an inclusive world. So meaning that, you know, we all have a, a level of privilege and you've probably heard the expression white privilege and that privilege can also be used in a good way. So for instance, if when you, you can bear witness to, to, to things that, that, um, that you might, that you might see when you see examples of, of racism that, 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 that can be used um, to, 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 to bear witness, to, to call, to, you know, hold folks accountable. We can use our privilege to, to, to do that. Um, I want to also just pause it with you and I'm just you know I'm throwing I know I'm throwing a lot of, at you in a very short time and I apologize but um, so I want to ask you about positionality and so just for a moment and maybe in a chat you can tell me when you see this statue what does it what does it bring to mind I'm gonna wait for 20 seconds and you know what do you think when you when you see this when you see the statue
just get oh sorry i can't see the chat what do you see colonial oppression haley okay okay so does anybody know emperor. what this sorry Rebecca. Sorry. sorry someone sent to me the word emperor emperor okay so so this is this is actually um egerton ryerson um, Ergerton Ryerson was named, um, which is named U Ryerson University, is named after um, uh, Ryerson, uh, Ms. Egerton Ryerson, and of course he was the creator, the founder of of um, of uh, of, uh, of the school of schools for Indigenous people, where they were taken away from their families and put into put into these these schools. Um, for for indigenous children, and uh, and that that happened here, you know, here in Canada, um, and and he, yet we still have this statue here in downtown Toronto. If you think about it, the, the largest, you know, largest most most uh, culturally diverse city with a very large indigenous community, and we have have a picture, uh, we have a statue dedicated to to him, and. And and what it does is it actually erases the histories of of what Canada was, right? We were a colonial a colonial settler country that erased the histories of our indigenous peoples. Um, and so. My apologies. Okay, so I'm gonna. I want to pause right there because I want to bring Bernie back in because we did talk. I'm just looking at the time, Bernie, and uh, and just wanted to because I wanted to give time for you and I to talk about our questions, and then I'm gonna jump back to those slides afterwards. Okay. Thank you, uh, Nigel, and we will get back to these slides. There are a few questions that that I want to ask. And uh, then that will allow us to, um, uh, to, to move into questions from the folks as well, because I know there are a lot coming in already. So Nige, and you can hear me, right? Yes. We're good, okay. So we have an interesting history together, the black and Jewish communities. We have both suffered through decades. Um, at first we walked separate but parallel roads facing discrimination independently. Uh, this changed actually in the 1960s, especially during the uh, leadership in, in the U.S. civil rights movement with the leadership of Martin Luther King and Rabbi Abraham Heschel, um, a, a revered and respected rabbi on one side, a young civil rights uh, activist on the other, uh, walking arm in arm to, um, to, to fight and to demand uh, equality and, and equity. And their spirit was actually felt here in Canada as well, uh, when it was commonplace in the mid 20th century to find Jewish and black leadership leading the way to human rights legislation and more. And many people on this call may not realize, but back in the 1950s, right up until really 1954, believe it or not, there was here in Ontario, what was known as a religious uh, and uh, a religious land covenant. Now the religious land covenant actually covered two peoples. It covered the Jewish faith and people of color. So what did it mean? It basically meant that Jews and people of color in certain parts of this province were not permitted to buy and own land. And that, that while the covenant was, was not always carried out, uh, there were places around Windsor, Ontario, London, Ontario, certainly in the countryside where it was, where, where it was in practice and it was, uh, it was very commonplace. Um, and it wasn't until the mid-1950s, thanks to the work of the Canadian Jewish Congress at the time, um, as well as um, uh, the Canadian Labour Congress, a number of black leaders, etc., cetera, uh, that challenged the, uh, the land covenant in court that got, that got it dissipated. This, this was an example of, of Jewish leadership, black leadership, labor leadership, working together to address a, a, a civil rights matter. But sadly, we seem in the, in the intervening years to have lost that connection. 
So Knight, I'm just wondering why you think this is so, why have we kind of lost this connection? It's gone in, in, in kind of peaks and valleys, but right now as we talk, and I know that there are all kinds of questions coming up in relation to black leadership today as opposed to yesterday, and we'll get to that, but I'm on a general level, what is your sense of our being separated today? You know, I mean, right now, when you look at just everything from from housing, when you look at we talk, I touched on education. When I touched on um, how the the disproportionate use of force against black folk in the in um, by the Toronto, by the police, um, there is a deep sense of frustration that's that's shared. I mean, shared among men among many from different working class backgrounds, right? And and I think you know one of the challenges that we're ha that we have um, is to helping folks understand why they're in the circumstance that, that they're in. Why is it that my income is so low and I it makes it so difficult for me to 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 pay my rent or to buy a house or to buy a car? Um, I think that you know, folks are always looking for, and and you see it like you know that work that we do together right now, Bernie. That how we're seeing how the right the, the rise of white supremacists and white supremacy, and the way that they're using um, the current economic um, challenges that are faced by working class people right now. Um, it is it is it is very it makes things um, very difficult for people, and then. And, and 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 then there's always scapegoats that that you see it you see the, the 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 president of the United States the way he does it we see the way that many of the the groups that we're fighting and trying to put spotlights on it are trying to point fingers at, at different different communities or and saying that oh it's their fault why you're in the problem that that you're in and then I think the other piece too is is about history and about under you know having history written um, in a way that tells the truth. You know, I, I kind of just jump you know quickly pointed out about how how you know Ryerson Egerton you know is is being being um, grandioso down right here in, in downtown Toronto, but yet he he started these 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 schools that that took Indigenous children away from from their parents. So, you know, there is a, also a gap in the history and understanding that I think that, um, that many, many, many folk have, have, um, have don't, don't know and don't understand. And it's led to this going, you know, going away like that, exactly that moment you're talking about with, with Martin Luther King and, and, and he, he worked with so many folks from the Jewish community during that march and 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 all throughout the civil rights rights movement so i mean that's why for me that's is why i'm here and and why the work that we're doing together right now because we know that that that's what we need to do so let let's take let's take a little bit of a closer look at that because in, in my in my professional lifetime there was a brief coming together in the uh, in in the, in the 1990s uh, where the black community and the Jewish community came together to fight neo-Nazi groups like the Heritage Front. Unfortunately, it did, uh, and by the way, interestingly enough, the indigenous community came together as well. A uh, great leader of the uh, First Nations people here in Toronto, in urban Toronto, uh, Rodney Bobby Wash, uh, myself, the, there was Dr. Wilson Head was involved, um, and, and, and a number of others from Bad Sea, which we'll get into in a moment, the precursor maybe to Black Lives Matter, which we're also going to talk about. Um, but, you know, we, we came together at a time of crisis, um, but this changed almost with, almost immediately in the early 90s, there was a premiere of Garth Drabinsky Showboat, and many in the audience here will, will, will remember this. Uh, it seemed to uh, immediately stoke the visions once again between Jews and Blacks. So what I'm wondering about is from your perspective, uh, how can the Jewish community and the black community find better roads to communication? What do we have to do in order to uh, you know, bring ourselves together to maybe find that kind of spirit that we had back in the heady days of the 1960s and even in the 1990s when we did work together and we did beat them. I mean, when Jews and blacks come together, we're a formidable force. Yes. And when we're apart, uh, the divisions are obvious. Yeah, I, I mean, I think 
now more than ever, as we see the rise of white supremacy and, you know, the Jewish community also has a, you know, has been under attack by, by these, these, um, these, these, these horrible, these monsters, right? Around the globe, it's happening. And so it, it, we do have to form a united front to fight the fight against anti-Semitism, fight against anti-Black racism, fight against homophobia, fight against, you know, fight, um, you know, uh, for for dis disability rights, Th this is, in my opinion, that that time of of reckoning. And I think, I mean, our approach to the alliance has always been about education. It's always been about advocacy. I think that um, we we have to continue to like um, educate our youth, especially about those struggles. You know, the civil rights the civil rights movement isn't actually. Um, required reading, for instance, in, in, in K-12 schools, right? Um, and, and, and so, I, for me, my hope is around, is around the youth, is around our, 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 our children, because um, I do believe, I think that they see the world and they're like, what the heck is going on with you adults? Like, what's your problem? And, 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 and so they bring these, these fresh eyes and, and kind of let go of those, all those old tropes that, that have held us back from being united together. So, you know, I, I really do believe, Bernie, that it starts with our youth. So, so this is interesting. I, I agree with you very much that, that it starts with our youth. And I think kind of what we're seeing today, especially in this time of pandemic, where everything seems accentuated, passion, love, hate, uh, everything seems magnified to, to an extent that we haven't seen before. And so when, when, the, when the George Floyd murder uh, was uh, broadcast on televisions literally around the world and his dying phrase, I can't breathe, impacted us all you know, so, uh, so heavily um, that I think of all communities, Jews really did understand that. And here's where we have sometimes a divide that we should talk a little bit about because the divide goes, goes back into the past and uh, uh, sort of points its way into the future. So the precursor to Black Lives Matter, which we, we really do need to talk about, was a group here in, in Toronto called Bad C, which you may recall was a Black Action Defense Committee. And for people who know their history, that, this doesn't go back very far. We're talking about the late 80s and, and, and early 90s uh, when the Black Action Defense Committee was actually doing very much the same things that we're seeing Black Lives Matter do. Uh, but for reasons that uh, you know, better minds than ours are gonna have to figure out, it caught on for a bit and then it, it, it dissipated. Um, it took, sadly, the deaths of a number of young black men and women uh, to drive us to the point where we are today. And the, you know, the fact that we can see it, that we can see this now in front of our eyes, there's no more hiding away from the fact that there is anti-black racism there. There's no more hiding the fact that police uh, often mistreated, abused, and yes, even murdered young black uh, men and women. Many friends of mine, uh, friends of color, have said to me, uh, you know, when my kids were growing up, I mean, my kids are older now, but, in, uh, you know, their black friends, their parents would say to them, they would give them rules. Uh, if, if you're stopped by the police, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, put your hands on the steering wheel. I never thought of giving my children those rules. It never even occurred to me. And so here's where this divide, I think, really happens. Uh, Jews, as I said earlier, feel in their bones the pain of racism and bigotry. They know what it is. In, in the lifetime of some people here, and certainly in, in, in a generation or two, there is a deep-seated memory of an attempt to wipe Jews off the face of the earth. I was brought up uh, in, in a home uh, that where my father was a Holocaust survivor, the only survivor, the only Jewish survivor of his small village in, in Poland. I was brought up in what I would call, you know, the shadow of, of death, of this, of this terrible 
horrible tragedy. Anti-Semitism was a way of life for me growing up in Ottawa. I know what that pain feels like. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, I also know that my skin is white. And I'm very conscious of that. And I know the privilege that I have gained as a result of the color of my skin. And so while I cannot feel the pain that you feel, Nigel, as a person of color, I can feel the pain of what it means to be discriminated against. And I think many in our community uh, try to balance this and try to understand and wonder out loud, and I've already seen a few questions you know, pertaining to this, and we need to discuss this. Um, the murder of George Floyd really fueled the Black Lives Matter movement. And there are people in this crowd who are saying, of course Black Lives Matter, but don't all lives matter? And, and I understand that question intellectually, but I also understand in the heart of my hearts what it means to say Black Lives Matter. Because possibly uh, during World War II, during the Holocaust, Jews might have yelled out, you know what? Jewish lives matter. Doesn't mean that all lives don't matter, but people were ignoring Jews back then to, to the point of outright murder. And today, people ignore black, anti-black racism to the point of outright murder. So I'm, 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 I, 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 I'm hoping that I have explained this in a way that you can sort of take the ball and, and run with it a little bit and, and give us an understanding because there are people in, in, in this group that, that are watching this evening that uh, have heard that you know, some elements within Black Lives Matter are anti-Semitic. And, and they wonder, well, what, what, what do I do with that? What, what does that mean? How can I be a support as I want to be to the black community when a, an important group like Black Lives Matter may have within them elements of anti-Semitism? Um, and by the way, you know, anti-black racism, anti-Semitism, it exists everywhere in every corner, right? I mean, that's just the way it is. But maybe you can speak a little bit to that issue and then I'll come back with a follow-up question. So just before going to, to, I won't go directly to the Black Lives Matter, I think, you know, we have to remember that the showboat, that showboat that you spoke about, and, you know, I, I don't, you know, how many folks know about all of what happened, but, you know, showboat was a racist play. And, you know, you know, from what our elders, you know, some of the folks from Bad Sea, you know, found unfortunate was that somehow, you know, within the Jewish community, it was made to seem as if, you know, the the calling out of that play was being anti-Semitic. And that was a dissident that I, I still don't understand because, you know, if you look at the play, the play was racist and that's why the community called it out and wanted it stopped. It wasn't, it wasn't about trying to be anti-Semitic and that's maybe something that we can come, come back to. But I think, you know, what's at core here is understanding that here in Canada, you know, it's, I, this is where my presentation started off. We've had 200, over 200 years of, of racism. And the way that white supremacy works is that there, it's, a, it's, a, it's the belief that, that black people are less than people who present as white and, and, or people who are white. And that, and that, and that has played over for 200, you know, for hundreds of years in Canada. And it's so, for instance, when you hear Black Lives Matter call for defund the police, which means taking money from the police and investing it into the community to be used for things like rapid response to people who are having mental health issues. That's what it means. Um, um, but but the, that, that call is because, you know, the police uh, have have always been, you know, the police formed from, you know, the, the Middle Ages of, uh, that was used to protect rich people's, rich, rich white people's, usually of Aryan descent, um, property. And then police were used in the Deep South to maintain or, or bring back slaves and, and people who were enslaved and, and, and bring them back to the, to, to, the, to the South, to their slave owners. And then 
police in Canada was used to, to, to keep, the, keep our indigenous people on their reserves. So the experience of black people for centuries for the from the against from the state has always been we're not we're not the same we're not good enough and so and that is that that bias is what plays out in our educational systems that bias is what plays out in the justice system that bias is what plays out when dealing with the police uh, my mom and my dad did the same with me in regards to you know when i first got my license they had that had we call it the talk and it's not about sex it's about keep your hands on the steering wheel do not move your hands you say yes sir and you know answer their question in a very very polite way it was said to me every time i left my house because that's just the life that we live in and you know, I think that this is, you know, and I want to acknowledge, I mean, we have to acknowledge, I acknowledge that there's, anti, you know, that there's black anti-Semitism within the black community, but the black community is not monolithic. Like we, in the black community, we have, we have conservatives, you, sorry, that was, too, I hope that, I don't mean conservatism, the Beth David made, I mean, conservative in the blue, and that's still no offense to anybody, I apologize. But we have conservatives all the way to the other side that we have anarchists, and we have everything in between. And I'm certainly not speaking for the black community. I'm just sharing with you, this is what my experience is and this is what I know. So no one actually speaks for the community, but it's the same as with the Jewish community. I would never expect one person to voice to be representative of all Jewish folk. So I feel like that's, that's an important piece for us to, you know, in our growth, in our journey together, in our, on this continuum of racism and specifically anti-Black racism is to, to understand that what we're dealing with is, is, is white supremacy, is that the belief that people who are, who are Black are somehow less and that that is, in, in that is embedded in our society. Like, if you look at how 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 income is 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 distributed in our in our in our country, we have you know if you're you, you know um, women get paid sixty eight percent that of that of of of, of men. I, I can't remember the final stat. With you know if you're in, if you're a black woman or indigenous woman, you're you're being paid less than fifty percent on the same amount cents on the dollar for every dollar that a white male um, makes. So every piece every part in our society white supremacy is 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 embedded and it's got to start with acknowledging the white supremacy it's got to be acknowledging acknowledging white privilege and again and then this is hopefully i want to make sure that we get time for this bernie it's talking about how we use that privilege as allies to work together to fight back against the white supremacy so that are talking both both of our all of our communities. One of the things that we sh that we should remember, and I was reminded by by one of the congregants, or we're already into taking some of the questions that that people watching this uh, have put to us, and it's not something I forgot. So I don't want anybody to think this, but the Jewish community itself also is not monolithic. Um, we have European Jews, you know, from from Europe that are that are white. But we also have Sephardic Jews uh, who are brown. We also have Jews who are people of color. Um, I, I, I just happened this, in an earlier uh, meeting that you and I were at to see your little boy, um, who is a child of color and happens to be Jewish. He had a bris. I mean, <laughs> you of all people, of course, get this yeah. and know this. And so uh, our community is kind of an interesting kind of hodgepodge. Yes. Uh, the, the vast majority of us are, are white, but a significant number are also people of color and, and face two forms of discrimination, right? We face discrimination if they know that we're Jews and they face discrimination by, by the color of their skin. So some in our community get it doubly, if I could, if I could put it that way. So the question is, and, and you, you pose a good question, so let, let me throw it back at you. Uh, and, and, and we've been asked this question as well. How, how do we create allyship? How do, um, do, do we have to, do, does the Jewish community have to uh, engage and be able to say, 
at, you know, from the outset, those of us who are white acknowledge our white privilege. But at the same time, we acknowledge our own understanding and pain of discrimination. Is that one of the roads that will lead to allyship? What are some other roads that we can take in, in order to, to, to make this happen amongst both our peoples? I think, again, we talked about the youth. And one of the th amazing th things about participating in this moment of calling the, the call for defunding the police and, and, uh, and, and the, this movement, the Black Lives Movement, is that it's, it's not, it, you know, while it's being led primarily by Black, tra by black women, tra trans, trans women, um, and trans men, and trans, and trans people who have traditionally always never been um, seen on the forefront, you know, it's always been about Martin Luther King and the Black males, um, there's so many young um, white uh, youth that are bringing their intelligence and their their um, critical analysis and and their courage, you know, putting their their lives on the bottom, you know, um, that I can't tell you how many young Jewish um, youth that I've seen that are out there organizing right now, like. Honestly, Bernie, it's already happening. You know, it's um, that's the exciting part. I think it's the it's you know it's the older generation that because of all the trauma that we've gone through, the trauma that we you know it's generational trauma, Bernie, that that you've talked about. That you know what what happened to your father and your grandfather and your your family, like you know, and what's happened within the black community. These are generational trauma that we're that we're dealing with, and I think that. Um, you know, as our youth start, you know, this, their cultures are intersecting with each other and they're coming, coming together. I think that, you know, that's going to be part of it. Today is a, a wonderful example of, of how, you know, the faith community is looking beyond just its four walls to try to see how we can work with other communities, how we can lift up other community. Um, but I think, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it, it continues, it is, you can't get around the education piece, we can't, we can't get around the just, you have to show up piece, right? I mean, even right now, for instance, the, you know, I, I don't know how many parents are on the line right now, but, but uh, we, the public schools are, are in an uproar, right? Because, because the, you know, we're in the middle of COVID, school's supposed to start in five weeks, and the government is put out a plan that that is you know woefully inadequate in in our in regards to the returning to school right and 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 they and while the government you know while the the premier has said well you know if you don't want to send your child it's okay you don't have to you know that's not a choice that's open for many black indigenous and people of color and so here's a perfect example of where white people from you know middle middle class neighborhoods from the you know from from wealthy neighbors can say to the premier absolutely not we need you to fund the public education system appropriately to make sure that because that is what is going to be the great equalizer so you know that's a that's one example of of i think it's that we have to start working you know in our struggles together um you, you know, know uh, kids I, in Rexdale, you know, where I grew up, children in Regent Park don't have the same privileges as children in other neighborhoods. So we're going to have to figure, you know, we have to A, have them work, you know, they're going to be working together. They're going to be, you know, playing together and we have to have them struggling together. You know, um, I think that there's a sense uh, there, there, there is somebody in the, in, in the uh, viewing group here. I, I don't know if this question is to me or, or if it's to you. So I, I'm just going to pose, I'm not going to say who, who asked, but it, it, it's an important feeling that she has. And we talked about this being a safe space. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to ask this question uh, from this person uh, who, who's feeling this. And um, the, the person asked uh, in, in, in the chat um, why it is that either you or I, I'm assuming it must be me, but I, I don't know, would presume, it's to me. Thanks. <laughs> would presume <laughs> that because this person is white, that this person is, is a racist. It's an, it's an interesting question because 
um, uh, I, I've heard this um, in, in, in meetings that I have been at very recently where uh, you know, members of the uh, black and, and, and white communities have come together to, to try and, and, and deal with racism. And this question comes up a lot. Why is it that there is a natural presumption that white folks are, you know, are, are, are racist? Um, I'm going to ask you that question first and then I'm going to answer it as well because we may have the same answer. We may have a different answer. Yeah. But you, you take it. I, look, again, um, we all, racism exists in Canada. Um, you know, people aren't racist on purpose. It's because you haven't, we don't, we haven't walked the same journey together. And we talked about the different types of racism, the sex systemic, the interpersonal. Um, we talked about the microaggressions and I shared with you the different, the different cartoons because of, you know, what we think about the other, right? And, 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 and that, you know, I, again, I'm within the, our hour, I've been trying to tie it back to where, you know, Canada started with racism. We had with, with slavery um, because of white supremacy that, that through state infrastructure, like the police, like, edu like education, the justice system has treated people differently. So we're always seen different. Right. So, you know, I always I do notice when if a woman clutches her purse because I'm walking by her. Right. I do notice the the the, cl the store clerk watching me as I walk in the store, even though I'm <laughs> anyway, we won't we won't go there. So 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 if a black person says what you did was racist, it's not saying that they're not accusing you for life of being racist, but they are sharing with you that you did something that was racist. And, and while it's, you know, I can only equate it to, you know, as, as a male during, you know, if when a woman calls me on mansplaining, it's not me to be like all of a sudden saying, oh, well, I'm not a mansplainer. It's me to say, you know what, I'm sorry that I offended you. And, in, and when you're ready to do the emotional labor of helping me to understand what I did and how I can avoid doing it again, I, I want to engage in that conversation. If a black person says what you did was racist, they're not per they're not purposely trying to like you know make you have a bad day. They're not you know remember we talked about the gaslighting. It's because what you did was racist, and it's emotional labor to talk to people about about when they did something racist. Like it's it's like it's not easy. I mean, but we have no choice because the opposite like it, it means if you don't say it anything then it continues right so um so i think uh i think that 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 while it, i know that you know what was it funny i think one perfect example of that was in the united states with ronald reagan i think in his memoir he wrote about how the one thing that he was so upset about in his whole life it wasn't about him starting a war that based on lies it wasn't him about mishandling katrina it was because um kanye west said he didn't like black people that in his memoir that's what he wrote and i realized that even if, if the president of the united states feels that way just because you said yo you're a racist i can you know i understand that people in our daily lives feel that you know um, when a black person says what you did was racist and they get upset about it, but you know, it's, it, it, it is emotional labor just to say it to you. And, and I really, you know, if there's one thing you can just understand that people aren't, they, they're not trying to like make you vilify you for life, but it is something that we have to understand. It's just part of this world that we're in. You know, I'm pause I, there because I'd like to hear what you say. Okay. I, I, I need to thank you for your answer because you have uh, verbalized a feeling that I have been talking about most of my professional life. Um, when, I, when I was growing up in Ottawa, uh, Ottawa was a, a small, it's a small town now, but it was even smaller back then. And there were maybe 2,000 Jews that lived in Ottawa. Now, I was one of maybe two or three Jews in my entire school and literally, a day did not go by that I didn't suffer uh, some kind of an anti-Semitic attack or, or, or a bullying event or something you know, in, in that nature. And I grew up honestly believing that anybody who wasn't a Jew 
hated Jews. Uh, you know, it was like, it was sort of like part of the culture for me. Um, it, it, it took me a long time to feel safe amongst those that were, were not Jewish. My expectation always was that I was disliked, that I was hated because of, you know, because of my, my faith. So when, when, when I got this dream job of heading the Canadian Jewish Congress, it was like, wow, I had all this baggage that I was able to sort of, you know, take off my back. And uh, we were able to engage in workshops, talking to people about uh, how do you deal with anti-Semitism? How do you deal with anti-Semites? And what I was saying to them is exactly what you're saying to us. You know, don't hate me because I say to you that what you've done might have been anti-Semitic and let's talk about it. I've told people, yes, you, you must confront this. Is it an assumption that, that Jews make that, that non-Jews are, you know, are, are anti-Semitic? Many probably do, sad, sad to say. But at the same time, I think that by bottling it up, and I think this is what you were saying to us, by refusing to say anything, A, the anti-Semitism doesn't go away or the anti-Black racism doesn't go away. And B, you have to keep this bottled up in your head always. I mean, it, it, it becomes a, a form, a kind of a tension that, that eats away at your soul. And so I, I think the message that you gave is the same message that I would give as a Jew that yes, there are people out there who have built-in prejudices. Um, they prejudge people based on whatever, their upbringing, their life, what they've read, what, whatever stupidity may be out there. And yes, I think, and it puts a lot on you as a, as a black person, it puts a lot on me as a Jew. But when we are confronted by these attitudes, we have to reconfront them ourselves. We have to my father used to say, if you want to get something done, you got to open a mouth. Well, he's quite right. We have to confront these attitudes honestly, um, safely, and passionately and civilly. Um, and, and so I think we both have that responsibility. Um, you know, if, 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 if you as a person of color sees somebody like myself or others do something that is racist. And by the way, I still catch myself doing things and saying things that, um, you know, in, in, in terms of all, all kinds of prejudices that I have to remind myself, hey, you know, pull, pull that back because that's not right. So, you know, um, when it comes down to it, I mean, I don't think it is right now that we all see everybody in one particular way. But because of who we are and because of, what, of our histories, separate histories, albeit, but because of our histories, we're on edge. We get it. We understand that people are going to be this way. And it's not a matter of judging them. It's a matter of, of, of understanding uh, you know, the, the paths that we've traveled down and our, uh, our need, basically, to, to confront that and to open the mouth. So... It, it, it's interesting. You, a, a black man, and me, a, a white Jew, uh, have that same felt experience, and found ways to uh, to verbalize the need to to confront these issues without judging and without casting blame. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I think I've, I've had questions that were sent to me directly. I don't know what you want me to do with those at the moment. Well, you know, why don't, uh, we're, we're gone a little bit over time, but why don't you take two of those questions and answer them? Okay. They're uncomfortable questions, but I will do so. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'll, I will, I'll let them remain anonymous, um, but I'll read the question so you hear what the question is and I'll do my best to respond appropriately. Um, so the question is, do you think the victimhood of many in the black community, whether right or wrong, will ever end. Is that the view that you want to pass on to your children? So, I mean, it's hard because I, it's hard to unpack that question because there's, it's, it's pretty loaded, obviously. And um, I feel like I've, I've shared with you what my 
where my location is because my what I fight against is anti-black racism, against anti-Semitism, um, homophobia. Um, it's what I do every day in the classroom and 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 through my work with the Canadian Anti-Hate Network and 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 with um, and with uh, and with Urban Alliance. So so you know I don't see it as victimhood. Like I mean, for me. Um, I've what I've read. I understand the Jewish community for thousands of centuries have always fought against the oppressors. You fought against the Egyptians. You fought against everybody, you know. And and in the black community, you know, while we don't hear about it, while you don't hear read about it in the in the in the in the in the books in the history books, we've always fought against against our oppression. It was, you know, I mean. You know, you, you hear about the Underground Railroad and, and, and those types of famous conversations, but there's always been resistance um, um, to, 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 to racism. And, uh, and, and do I believe that, and I, as I said, I believe that our children are, that are coming up get that and they're, they're going to take the mantle from us in regards to making the world a better place for all of us, right, where we all feel safe where we all feel like we can, you know, raise our children and, 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 and feel loved and feel belong, belonging in our, in, our, in our city, in our country, and in this planet. I believe that that's what we all want, regardless of where in the planet that you come from. So um, that's the best I'm going to answer that question right at this moment. So I'll, I'll turn that back over to you, Bernie. Well, um... I have to say that this has been a very uh, emotional experience for, for me, uh, listening to you, Nige, because it's really the first time that you and I have had this, uh, this opportunity to share. And uh, it, 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 it's going to lead to much more conversations between you and me. And I'm, I'm hoping to learn uh, a, a lot more. And I'm, I'm hoping that I might be able to teach you a lot more as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this. I want to sum up kind of where we began. And that was with the development of the organization uh, of which you are now president of the Urban Alliance on Race Relations. You made mention of the fact that uh, a number of, of community leaders uh, got together to, to form really what was or what is today this wonderful organization that, that you head. And I, uh, you know, I'm, I've always been a huge supporter of, of the Urban Alliance. And I just want to mention two names because these two names are heroes, personal heroes of mine. And one happens to be Black and the other one happens to be Jewish, and the two of them were instrumental in the development of the, uh, of the Urban Alliance and Racial Race Relations. That's Dr. Uh, Wilson Head um, and Rabbi uh, Gunther Plaut. Um, these were uh, the civil rights heroes of Canada. And, um, you know, they came together decades ago with a dream um, and with a hope. And that dream and that hope was that uh, one white, Jew and one black man can stand side by side, can uh, join arms side by side, and by their very presence and by their very dignity, <coughs> create, uh, create an, a, an essence for us, create this, um, uh, this road to travel down. So, uh, Nige, I, I, I thank you really from the bottom of my heart for what was really a, 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 in, in an hour and 10 minutes an open and, and honest discussion. Um, I look forward to doing this again with you um, and, and uh, learning as we go along, because as you said, this is a first step. Uh, there are many, many more steps to take. I want to also thank uh, the Zoom audience. Uh, you, you followed Nigel's advice. You accepted this as a, as a safe space. You asked questions that were, that were difficult um, and we may not have provided all the answers uh, but this is only the beginning. Uh, we have many more uh, times, hopefully together, and many more questions uh, and answers uh, to, to, uh, to work out together. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to my friend, Essien. Uh, again, I want to thank Beth David and all of those that were involved in, in putting this together. But mostly, Nigel, I want to thank you for putting your soul on the line here today and speaking to, uh, you know, almost maybe over 100 people who I'm sure took away a, a, a lot of, of, of your sense of, uh, of humanity. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so, so very much. Um, well, we've exceeded our time this evening and uh, I'm confident we could continue for much longer. 
Um, and we've heard much to think about this evening, albeit the tip of a very, very large iceberg. Uh, indeed, the discussion is, uh, I think, a long game, not a sprint. So we are comforted knowing that uh, we don't need to pack it all in within one evening. There will be more. Uh, Nigel, you are very obviously a, a rich source of perspective, insight, and information. On behalf of Beth David, our congregants, and the broader community attending this evening, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be with us this evening and to help us begin our series of programs on racism, helping us look deeper within ourselves and our community so we can take meaningful action to make ourselves and our community better. As a racialized Jew myself who straddles both the Jewish community and the broader community, I can firmly say that, that so much of what you spoke about this evening resonates with me, you know, in particular your comments about microaggressions. <laughs> some, some subtle examples, and my experience uh, is also that microaggressions can be even more subtle than that, insidiously real. Um, so I'm confident you've given our audience a lot to think about. Thank you. Bernie, on behalf of Beth David and our community, I also want to thank you for kindly working with us to make this evening possible. You too are undoubtedly a wealth of experience and wisdom and, and information, and indeed, you are a catalyst in our society for change. We're privileged to have you with us this evening. You and Nigel in the same room, so to speak, are a titanic tour de force, if I may say. A perfect kickoff to our anti-racism programming. I sense that questions will still be forthcoming uh, from our audience. I invite any of you who still have questions to email your questions to our team member, Kareen Berman, at cberman at rogers.com. That's C-B-E-R-M-A-N at rogers.com. If you prefer, you can reach out to Beth David's office and they will pass your questions to Corinne and we will do our best to consolidate these questions and provide responses. If we can't answer them shortly, we will work to try and integrate them into future programming. I also again invite you to reach out to the shul if you have ideas for future programming. Lastly, I'd like to reiterate that our next program will take place on Wednesday, August 26th at 7.30 p.m and will feature a panel of Beth David members who together with Rabbi Shine will explore anti-racism and Judaism. And that event will also unpack our prayer for Canada as a practical step toward creating meaningful anti-racism action. The, uh, the event will be advertised on the Beth David website and I understand it will also be featured on the UJA Federation calendar. So thank you everybody for attending this evening and have a very good night. Good night all. Good night.